Good morning. Thank you for tuning in to the Sunday morning message from Vestavia Primitive Baptist Church. I'm Josh Coker, and I'm glad to be here today uh, bringing you a message uh, through the internet. It's different. It's strange to be here and to see uh, the pews and to see the child's backpacks and toys and folks' jackets and things that were left, not knowing uh, that the last time we were here would be the last time we'd meet for uh, a month, two months, uh, whatever time it ends up being. I pray you're all well. Um, I pray that the Lord's blessing you in this time, and I pray that we can use it uh, uh, to grow closer as families, um, that we can, as Brother Sam said last week, that we wouldn't get better. We wouldn't get bitter, uh, but we would get better during this time. Certainly hard times for many people, and um, we're praying uh, that the Lord would just bless his people throughout this land and throughout the world. Um, if we've learned anything over the last few weeks, it's that uh, circumstances can change in an instant. Uh, there's no one listening today uh, that couldn't have their life totally changed abruptly by one phone call, uh, by one doctor's appointment, by one pink slip at work. Um, our lives can change in a hurry. Many things that change our lives are outside of our control. Uh, life can become very difficult in a short period of time. And that's been true for, for, for mankind throughout the ages. Uh, we may have been shielded from it in America for so many years. We've had, it, we've had it pretty good. And there's been ups and downs in our economy, but we've had religious freedom. Uh, we've had great health care. Uh, we're, we're blessed as a nation. Uh, but we've even seen over the last few weeks that America is not immune uh, to, to falling in a short period of time. So we do want to pray for our leaders. We want to pray for, for our nation, as I mentioned earlier. But we need to be aware that things can change in a hurry. And, you know, I want to look this morning at kind of a wild ride Christ's closest disciples had. And we're going to look to the book of John, starting in chapter 12 and ending in the first three verses of chapter 14, uh, and just kind of look at, at, the, at the wild ride that these disciples took, these people who had left, these men who had left their jobs behind, who had left their religion in many ways behind, uh, to follow this man who claimed to be uh, the Messiah, the Christ, who was the Christ, who was the Messiah, who was God with us, and, and now they're following him. And, and they're seeing so many things, and there's major ups and major downs, uh, much like uh, the life of a disciple here on earth. And we'll start in John chapter 12 and verse 12. Read these first, uh, verse 12 and verse 13. As Jesus is riding into Jerusalem, it says, On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna! Blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. They're crying, Hosanna. It's an appeal for deliverance. Here comes the king. Here comes the one we've been waiting for all these years. And these, these close disciples that Jesus had are, are seeing this. Uh, they're a witness to this. And they're, they're friends with this man who, who they're, they're laying the palm trees in front of him, waving the branches and welcoming in this, this king who's riding on uh, this donkey into Jerusalem. And, and you know they had to be lifted up. Uh, you know, one thing that encourages me throughout the Gospels is that the disciples, they rarely got it. And what I mean by that is they were often confused. They were often didn't understand what Jesus was saying. And I find myself in that position uh, many times. But you know they had to think, this is, this is amazing. This is different. This is something we've never seen before. These people are welcoming Jesus in, and it's this... A triumphal entry, if you will, although it was, it was not what many kings would, would have. It's not what they portray uh, in the movies of a king's entrance. But here comes uh, the true king, Jesus Christ, into Jerusalem, and there's much fanfare around this. You know they had to be excited. And then in chapter 13, we have the Last Supper. And that's really a, a high point in the life of Christ's disciples. Um, it quickly turns into something that I believe is challenging to them and confusing to them. But, but they're having this, 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 this supper, and, and Christ gets up from the table and girds himself with a cloth and, and begins to wash their feet. And if you've never been in a, 
in, a, in, a, in a, a service where you wash one another's feet, your brothers and sisters in the church, uh, you, you can't even begin to imagine what the disciples are feeling at this time. Um, but if you've been in one, you kind of have a glimpse. If you've been in a foot washing service where God was in the midst of that service and, and just the, the emotions and the, and the spiritualness of, of bowing down at the feet of, of, of another believer, another disciple, another child of God and washing their feet in an act of humility, uh, it, is, it is a very touching thing. And, and we know God was in the midst of this because God was the one washing their feet. And, and, he, and he speaks to Peter, and, and, and there's still some confusion in Peter's uh, voice. You, you hear uh, Peter says, no, don't wash my feet. But he ends up saying, no, wash me all, Lord. And, and so it's this, this high point in the life of the disciples. But quickly that changes. And, and, and the first thing that we're going to see, there's at least five things just in chapter 13 that the disciples face that you and I face throughout life. And the first one's going to be the betrayal of a friend. Uh, Jesus is going to tell them that there's one among them who is a devil who's going to betray Christ. He's going to betray the disciples that were there. And certainly we know in hindsight that that was Judas Iscariot. And Judas was going to betray Christ. He was going to turn on the disciples. And what heartache that, that had um, to give to his friends, the ones that had been close to him, following him. If you've, if you've been in a church for very long, you know there are those who, who are rock solid, who you can count on, and, and sometimes even they fall away. But there's people that you become close to in the church, and they, they turn away. Um, in, in high school, uh, if you're in high school, you know you have friends, and they may betray you. Uh, you may have had a spouse that betrays you, an employer that betrays you. We all are going to be uh, betrayed by people in this life. There will be people that let us down, and that's what the disciples are facing at this time. And, and then the second thing is that they're facing the loss of a leader. Let's listen to John chapter 13 and verse 33. This is after Judas has left, and, and the 11 disciples are left, and Jesus is really telling them what's about to happen. And he says, little children, yet a little while am I with you. You shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you. These men who had left everything, as I mentioned earlier, are now hearing from the voice of their leader that he's going away. And where they're going, or where he's going, they can't come. And you know, it's amazing what a, a leader of an organization, the leader of a movement, um, the, the effect that he can have on those that follow him. And, and a lot of times when a, when a leader is gone, uh, the entire organization or movement falls or crumbles. And, and here you know that they had to be upset that their leader was leaving. Let's look at verse 34 and 35 as we'll see that now they're, they're dealing with change, something new. Christ says to them, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. He says, a new commandment I give unto you. Uh, there's, there's change coming to the disciples. Their, their religion, uh, the, the things that they have followed throughout their lives are, are, are beginning to change. And although God's people have always been called to love, he said, there's this new commandment that I'm giving you. There's, uh, now you're going to have to love unconditionally, self-sacrificially. You're going to have to to love them as Christ said in the first verse, uh, as the Bible says in the first verse of John chapter 13, that he, you're going to have to love them to the end. You're going to have to love people. This commandment that I'm giving to you is to love your brothers and sisters to the end, just like I did, a, a humble love, a, a never-ending love. No matter what they do to you, no matter how they treat you, I'm calling on you to love, to give of yourselves for others. And so they're facing change. I know if you've ever faced something new or change at the workplace or, or wherever it may be, a lot of times we're very resistant to change and sometimes for good reasons. But here the disciples are facing change. And then let's, let's read verse 36. Keep reading here. Simon Peter said unto him. Simon speaks up. Peter speaks up. He usually does that in the Gospels. He speaks up and he says, Lord, 
Whither goest thou? Where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I go, you cannot follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. And there's confusion. And, 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 and like I said earlier, the disciples were often confused. And if you're confused uh, in life, if you're confused about spiritual things, uh, you're in good company. You're, you're there with, with Peter, and James, and John. Uh, they were often confused as well. But there's confusion. He says, where are you going, Lord? And then, listen to verse 37 and 38. Peter says unto him, unto Christ, Lord, why can I not follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto thee, I say unto you, Peter, the cock, the rooster, shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice, or three times. Peter says, Where are you going, Lord? And, and he, says, he says, You don't know right now, Peter. <laughs> Peter says, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything for you, Lord. And, and this, this God, God, Jesus Christ, who these men are following, looks at Peter and he says, no, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And, and Peter is now face to face with his human weakness. How many of us face our weakness every day? How many of you make resolutions? Maybe you've been stuck at home. You say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. You know, I saw something um, online this week, and it said, you know, I've always wanted to have a clean house, and I've always wanted to fix up these things around the house, but I just haven't had time. My excuse was I don't have time. And now we're all stuck inside. And so this, uh, this, this meme or whatever it was online, it says, now I've realized that wasn't the excuse. It's just me. <laughs> I'm lazy. I don't want to do these things. How many of us face that in life? The things, like we could say with Paul in the book of Romans, chapter 7, and I'm paraphrasing this, but the things that I want to do, that's, that's the things I find myself not doing. The things that I don't want to do, I find myself doing. How many of us come face to face every day with our human weakness? I know I do. And, and look, we can get through that through God's Spirit, but we are weak people. We are people in need of a Savior. And Peter is now face to face. The disciples are seeing that kind of their leader... Uh, the, the leader of the disciples, not talking about Christ, but Peter, kind of their spokesman, the one that would always speak up. He says, I'll follow you, Lord. And Jesus says, no, you won't. You're going to deny me three times, Peter. And so they're faced with human weakness. And so we move to John chapter 14. And I've spoken on this before at this church and, and, and maybe others. But I think it's very relevant in the situation that we face now uh, in our country and throughout the world uh, because we're confused. We're being faced with our weakness. We, there's an invisible virus that we can't stop. Our greatest leaders, they have to be humbled by the fact that they can't, they can't outspend this virus. They can't... They, they can, they can do things to try to mitigate the risk, or stop the spread, but, but we are face to face as a, as a world with just how weak we are, just how, how much we're, we're really not in control of some things. And, and, and here, the feelings that you and I have from time to time, and I hope you have a good spirit about you and a good attitude about you, you know, we can go through this with a bad attitude or a good attitude, and, and I hope we try to go through it with a good attitude. Um, but the things that we're feeling, they were feeling. Confusion, betrayal, weakness. And Jesus turns to them, and let's read the first three verses of John chapter 14. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. He knew they were troubled. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus looks at these troubled disciples, these people who've been following him for three years, and he says, don't, don't let your heart 
be troubled. Don't, what he's saying is don't allow your heart to be troubled. Don't permit your heart to be troubled. That's what that word let means. I mean, we're not, we aren't robots. We, we make decisions. We choose. We may not choose what happens to us, but we, we can choose how we react to things. Uh, we can decide uh, how we're going to react to situations in our lives. We have that power. Just when, when, like when God said, let us make man. Let us uh, make the world. That's in, that's in the very beginning of the Bible. And we are made in the image of God and we have that uh, ability uh, to make decisions, decision making like God has. As creatures in His image, we have that ability. And he says, he says, don't let your heart be troubled. That's, trouble is, is inward commotion. Uh, it's it's t- really to take away your calmness of mind. And you know, a lot of times having faith is just staying calm in hectic situations. And that's what Christ is saying to His disciples. Don't let your heart be troubled. I, I wrote down a few things about the, the heart. And, and I'm not talking about uh, the, the, the muscle, the organism in your chest that pumps blood throughout your body. We're talking about the seat of your emotions. We're talking about uh, the, the, the place in you where your desires and your actions flow out of your heart. The Bible mentions the heart many times. The heart is very important. Listen to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. It says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. He says, what, what, what the writer of Proverbs here, Solomon is saying is that you need to protect your heart, to guard your heart like a keeper of a prison, uh, to, to protect and guard what comes into your emotions, what comes into your very soul, the thing that drives you. You need to protect that. You need to, you need to watch what you watch. You need to watch what you read. You need to watch who you're around. That's what he's saying. And, and that's, that's a full-time job. He says, keep your heart with all diligence. That's with consistency, with much effort. This is something we can't, we can't lay off of. We can't get lazy about watching uh, the things that we let into our life to influence our life. And he says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Everything you do, the choices you make are determined by your heart, uh, by, that, by that, that thing that's inside of you that, that drives you. He says, out of it are the issues of life, the, things, the way you react to your wife. The way you study for a test, the way you handle hard situations, all of that is determined by the way you prepare your heart. So he says you need to guard it with all diligence. And, and Christ is saying to his disciples, don't let your heart control you based on these circumstances. Don't let your heart be troubled. And then he's going to give them four things that we'll look at that they need that they need to know, and things that we need to remember in time in heart troubling times. Make no mistake about it; these are difficult times that that really none of us have ever been through. And you're going to face difficult times in your life when this is over. There will be heart troubling times. There are things that happen that break our heart. There are things that happen uh, that 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 make us want to lose control. But the words of Christ is don't, don't lose control. Don't let your heart be troubled. And the, and the first thing that he's going to tell us here is, is, is remember to trust in me. That's what he's going to tell his disciples. And that's what he's telling us today. Trust in me. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. To believe is to put your trust in or to entrust something to someone. And so... Who are we trusting to these times? Are we trusting in our, in our leaders and the amount of money they can spend? Or are we trusting in Christ to get us through? Who are you trusting for your marriage? Who are you trusting for your church growth? Those are good questions that we need to ask ourselves. Who are we trusting? And, and, and Christ is saying, you need, to, you need to trust in me, guys. The, the Bible would say, through Christ, all things consist. He holds all things together. He's worthy of our trust. He loved you enough to leave heaven and die on a cross for you. That's that's a trustworthy individual. He is ever faithful. He ever lives to make intercession for you. And he's telling his disciples, you believe in God. 
They had grown up in religious circles. But he's saying, I want you to... And they've been walking with him. But he's saying, you need to trust me. You need to believe in me. You need to entrust your life to me. That's why the Apostle Paul... In 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul is about to face uh, persecution. And he says, but I know who I've believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. He said, I've entrusted my life to Jesus Christ. And, and you see the peace that the Apostle Paul... Go read 2 Timothy. Go read it tonight. You've got time. Go, go see that the, the Apostle Paul is facing death, but he faces it with peace. He, 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 is, he is writing to Timothy to encourage Timothy. You would think this man who's imprisoned, who's about to, to, who knows that his life is about to be offered up, you would think Timothy needs to encourage him, but he's encouraged in Timothy because he knew who he had believed who he had put his trust in. He was persuaded that Christ was able to keep him. That's the, kind of, that's the kind of attitude we should have and the mindset that we should have. And that's what Jesus is telling his disciples. Remember to believe in me. Then he says to remember that there's more to this world than meets the eye. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Christ takes their minds away from this temporal world and away from the confusion and the heartbreak and the betrayal that they had just witnessed or learned about in chapter 13. And he says, he says, in my Father's house are many mansions. He points them away from this world to a world to come. In my Father's house are many mansions. Sometimes we forget that there's more to life than this, than this world. There's more to life than right now. This in, in, in the introduction to his book, Glory to Come, Pastor Michael Goins writes this about the modern believer. He says he holds, the modern believer holds to this world with a tenacity that is no different than the unbeliever. The modern Christian, I suggest, has lost something very precious. He's lost the pilgrim perspective that was so characteristic of the early church. The early church thought of themselves as pilgrims and strangers in a world that was not their own. It was not their home. It was not where they belonged. And if you feel at friction with this world, if you, if you feel that there are things that you don't want to participate in this world, you find yourself even participating in those and they, and they make you mad, and they make you sad, that's because this world is not your home. And we need to understand that. We need to look to, there is another home for us, the Father's house. He says, there are many mansions. I love that. He says, he says, in my Father's house are many mansions. Not just for the few that, that do right all their lives and persevere to the end. I'm telling you, heaven is a place for sinners. Heaven's a place for the addict. Heaven's a place for the, the sinner. Heaven's a place for the person that doesn't get it right. Heaven's a place where the believer and the one who did get it right will be. Heaven's a place uh, that is going to be populated by people out of every tribe, every tongue, every nation. Uh, that, you know, to, we see with this virus that, uh, that no one is immune. It, it, it's impacting everyone. And so did the sacrifice of Christ. It impacted all nations. And there will be people from, from every kindred, as I just said, every tribe, every tongue, every language will be in heaven. It's a place of many mansions, many dwelling places. That's good news to me. That, 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 that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ saved many, not just a few. So many people think that there's just going to be just a few people in heaven. I don't see that when I read the Word of God. Jesus Christ came to save many, His elect children, and He did that. And that's what He's about to say. You need to, you need to remember what I did for you. He's about to say that. That's the, that's the third thing that we want to look at when we're in times of heart-troubling times. We trust in Christ. We, we remember that there's more to this world uh, than meets the eye. There's another place we're going. But then remember what Christ did for you. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go. Listen to what he said. I go. By himself. I, Jesus Christ, go to prepare a place for you. And, and, and so what he's saying is, is, is to them, remember what I'm about to do for you. And to us, it is, it is remember in times of trouble what Christ has done for us alone. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you in the Father's house, in heaven, in glory. To prepare is to, to make the necessary preparations to get everything ready. Now, Christ wasn't saying, I'm going back to heaven to build you a room, to build you a dwelling place, to build you a mansion. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. They were already there. 
What Christ is saying is, I'm going to make the, the, the payment necessary so that you, disciple of Christ, can live in the Father's house, can live in one of those dwelling places. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to go to Calvary and pay the price that you couldn't pay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the proper preparations through the sacrifice of myself so that one day you can live with God. Remember that, child of God. That is, that is good news in heart-troubling times. And I love what he says, I go. I don't go to make a way to make a way. Christ is not saying, I'm going to go do my part and you do your part. He says, I'm going to make preparations for you. When we get to heaven, we're not, we're not going to take any of the glory. You understand that today? It's all going to be the glory was going to be given to God. Salvation is all of God. And I wish we could all learn that, that, that salvation is alone through the sovereign grace of God. It was God the Father who chose His people, Christ the Son who died for His people. It's the Holy Spirit who regenerates His people. And Christ, this is the last thing that He's going to say, it's Christ that's coming back to get His people at the end of time. And that's the fourth thing and the last thing that I want to look at. In heart-troubling times, what do we need to keep in mind? We need to remember that Christ is coming back. He says in verse 3, And if I go, and we know He did, we believe by faith that He did, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto Myself, that where I am, there, there you may be also. Where I am. Christ today is seated at the right hand of God. He says, where I am, there you may be also. He speaks of Christ's return. How often do you think of Christ's return? I'm, I'm ashamed to tell you that some days I don't, I'm so busy with life that I don't think about it. I was speaking to, to my wife this week and I said, how often do you think about the return of Christ? What if we got up every morning saying, this is it. That was the primitive mindset of the early church was that Christ is coming back. And I'm going to tell you, that makes a big difference in life. When you're struggling, when times are hard, but when you have faith that your God's coming back to get you, that makes all the difference. Listen to 1 Thessalonians. The end of, the end of uh, it's chapter 1, the end of chapter 1, the end of verse 9, end of verse 10. Paul said that their, their faith was known throughout the world, and he says that you turned to God from idols. How many of us need to turn back to God from idols that we've set up in our lives. I do. You do. We all do. How you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. There is a coming wrath on this world And today, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you're a disciple of God, that, you, that you, you're not going to have to face through His sovereign grace because of what Jesus Christ did. That should make us want to turn from our idols. That should make us want to serve Jesus Christ. That should make us every day be waiting for the return. That is the blessed hope that Paul talked to Titus about, the the, the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. One day there's going to be a day like none other. We're going through times that we've never seen, but let me tell you, one day, I believe by faith that there's coming a day when the clouds will separate. There'll be a trump of God. Angels will come forward and Jesus Christ Himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Voice of the archangel and those who are dead in Christ will rise first. And those who are alive and remain will be called up to meet them in the air. And we'll all be with Christ and will forever be with the Lord. That's what Paul would tell these Thessalonican believers in just three chapters later. And he said, comfort one another with these words. Look, we need some good news, don't we? If you want bad news, if you thrive on bad news, then you should be in your happy place during these times because 
You can't get on the internet, you can't get on TV, you can't get on the radio without hearing some bad, bad news. My friends, I like good news. I thrive on good news. I thrive on this news. This is what I needed to be reminded of today. This is what I believe we all need to be reminded of today, that there is, there is a Lord that loves us, that we can trust in. There is, there is a Lord who has prepared a place for us in heaven that one day we will, we will be with Him. And that same Lord, He won't outsource it, that same Lord's coming back. He's coming back for you and me. That's good news, isn't it? That's the kind of news I need. That's the kind of news that makes me smile. Look, I, I, I don't like what I'm seeing on TV, but I like what I'm reading in this book. That's the kind of news that puts you in the kind of mood where you can be a good spouse, you can be a good parent, you can be a good church member. You can be a better person if you remember these things. Remember to trust in Christ. Remember there's more to this world than meets the eye. Remember that Christ by himself, alone by his sovereign grace, alone by the sacrifice of himself, finished the work that God had sent him to do. As we celebrate next week, we will, we will remember the crucifixion. We will celebrate the resurrection. But remember those last words that Christ said. It is finished. He had finished the work that God the Father had given him. And that work was to save his people. It's finished. That's good news. That's something to remember in heart-troubling times. That the biggest problem, child of God, you ever faced has been taken care of by the sacrifice of Christ. The biggest problem you've ever had has already been taken care of. The biggest problem you had is that you were at enmity with God. But Jesus Christ became sin for you so that you would live with Him forever. That's good news. And then remember that this one who sacrificed Himself for you is coming back again for you. The eighth chapter of Romans, it, that, that, those, the golden chain of salvation, it says... That, that all that were predestined, it ends up saying they will be glorified. They will be rendered excellent. There's coming a time where Christ comes back from you. He comes back for you. And you will be rendered excellent. And He'll deliver the kingdom up to the Father. And we'll be in the Father's house. In one of those many mansions that Christ made a way for us to be in. I love you, church. I look forward to seeing you again. May God bless you all.